Thank you. The next item of business is portfolio questions. Uh, and again, in order to get as many people in, it would be helpful to have succinct questions and answers. The first portfolio is uh, health and social care. And I would remind members that questions one and five are grouped together and that therefore I'll take any supplementaries on these questions once both have been answered. If a member wishes to request a supplementary question, they should press the request to speak button during the relevant question or indicate during the relevant question by entering the letter R in the chat function. I call question number one from Pam Duncan Glancy, who's joining us remotely. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the action it is taking to tackle the reported staffing shortages within the NHS. Cabinet Secretary. I'm fully aware, obviously, of the difficult circumstances that boards and frontline staff are working in. It's why we've worked hard to ensure our NHS has record levels of staffing, with increased numbers of staff over the ten, last ten consecutive years. And under this government, we now have over 28,700 whole-time equivalent more staff, or a 22.6% increase uh, in the last year alone. We're also investing record levels of domestic uh, of domestic training for doctors and nurses, and we've committed £1 billion as part of our recovery plan and one, uh, £300 million, uh, last winter that was announced to support additional recruitment, and that's already paying off. We see uh, that there has been uh, already successfully recruited 1,000 healthcare support workers. Uh, we recognise the challenges right across the UK and internationally in recruiting enough staff to meet changing service uh, demand. That's why we published a long-term workforce strategy on the 11th of March, setting out our clear ambition. And we'll work closely uh, with health boards, with health and social care partnerships, to produce new staffing projections in the autumn based on their three-year workforce plans. Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but the plans aren't working. In NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, nursing and midwifery vacancies have never been higher. The Royal College of Nursing report out yesterday found that there were 2,075 vacancies and around 11 per cent posts unfilled. A constituent has been in touch with me about the impact this has had on them. They waited 16 months for a potentially life-changing procedure, and when they finally got the appointment, a nurse spoke of lengthy waits and said that during the pandemic, and crucially, during periods when they were remobilised, that clinic at the new Victoria Hospital had to shut down four times to send staff to cover at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital due to lack of staff. Patients are being let down and staff have excessive workloads. The recovery plan isn't working. The Scottish Government must wake up to this crisis. Cabinet Secretary, the plan's not working. What, what more will you do to address workforce shortages with resources to back up any actions, including to improve paying conditions as a matter of urgency? Uh, thank you. Before I ask the Cabinet Secretary to respond, can I just say that is not an example of a succinct question? Cabinet Secretary. I'll try to give a more succinct uh, uh, answer if I can, but I do, I do recognise that Pam Duncan Clancy's uh, question is a very important one. I, I met, along with other uh, political health spokespeople from across the chamber, the RCN this morning, uh, and I welcome their nursing workforce in Scotland report. We heard very powerfully from nurses who are present some of the challenges they're facing. What I would say to, to Ms Duncan Glancy is overall nursing and midwifery staffing numbers are at a record high. They're up 14.5 per cent under this government. And of course, creating new posts is an essential part of workforce expansion. We are investing uh, in uh, our health service and, and, of course, I can give her lots of detail on that for sake of brevity. I will perhaps write to her about the investments that we are making, but what, the final point I would make is that if we can control transmission of COVID, that is the single biggest factor that will help with some of the workload pressures that our nurses are facing at the moment. Question number five, Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what it is doing to address reported workforce pressures in health and social care. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, again, uh, just to stress that staffing uh, has increased under this government for the last uh, 10 years. Uh, that increase uh, see, uh, has seen 28,700 more whole time equivalent staff under uh, this government. And our £1 billion recovery plan, our £300 million uh, sub to support uh, pressures across winter, are having an impact and an effect. We saw just this week the Scottish Ambulance Service, of course. Uh, have a record uh, single year uh, recruitment of 550 posts being recruited in a single year. A thousand additional healthcare support staff have also uh, been recruited because of the investment we're taking. So we engage closely with health boards and, of course, uh, integration authorities across the country to offer our support, and the situation is under constant review. 
I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. The RCN report he refers to concludes that there are simply not enough nursing staff to provide the care our population needs. In Fife, nursing and midwifery vacancies are, have never been higher at 575. In Tayside, there are 452 posts unfilled, up nearly 300 since the pandemic started. We are living with the consequences of the decision taken by Nicola Sturgeon when she was Health Minister to cut the number of training places for uh, nurses and midwives. So what specifically is the Scottish Government going to do to tackle uh, the issue of staff retention given so many are leaving at present due to stress in the workforce? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I just reiterate that when it comes to nursing and, 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 and midwifery staff, of course, they are at record high levels across the country. They're up by 14.5%. Let me reiterate once again, if the member listens, uh, I'm trying to, of course, address the question here that the RCN report, of course, is important. Uh, he is right, there are a number of vacancies, but creating, of course, new posts is an essential part of that workforce expansion. That being said, I fully accept that we need to grow the workforce. So we have plans to do that through domestic recruitment, through the student pipeline, uh, through international recruitment. But his point about retention is an important one, is a fundamental one. And that's why, of course, our st staff are the best paid in the UK. But I promised and committed to the RCN today, as I have done previously, that we will look at the terms and conditions and we'll see what more we can do in order to retain what is an excellent skilled workforce. And I want to pay tribute to every single one of them. And are we able to take some, but not all, supplementaries? Uh, Sue Webber. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Cabinet Secretary, dis despite describing our plan for COVID recovery back to normality as reckless, I was very pleased that the SNP Government's updated strategic framework accepted a large number of our recommendations. Chief amongst these was the ending of mass testing in Scotland and its uh, replacement with a programme of representative sampling. While this is very welcome development while we learn to live with COVID, it will mean that 7,000 test and protect employees may have their contracts terminated early. Given the acute and unrelenting staff shortages across Scotland's NHS, what assessment and activity has the Cabinet Secretary made of the possibility of redeploying these workers to other parts of our health service? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think it's a very good question from Sue Webber, and just to, in the interest of brevity, give her an absolute assurance that our health boards and indeed our health and social care partnerships are working extremely closely uh, with our test and protect staff. And I want to again pay tribute for their incredible efforts over the course of the pandemic to see where we can redeploy them. Now, that it will be able to be done with some of them because there will be a skills match. There will be some who will want to stay within the NHS and social care. I can't promise it will happen with every single member of staff, but we are working exceptionally closely and we will look to redeploy as many of those hardworking staff uh, as we possibly can. Supplementary, Alex Riley. Presiding officer, we know that in social care there is a major recruitment and retention issue that is creating a crisis. We know that one of the major factors for that is the poor terms and condition and pay and unequal treatment, particularly those working in the private sector. Why then is the government not tackling this? And what will you do to tackle it, given if you don't, then this issue is just going to keep getting worse? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I just say, first and foremost, what we're doing is we're recruiting to that workforce. I just referenced in two previous answers that we have successfully recruited 1,000 healthcare support workers. Many of them will be working uh, in uh, social care. Uh, the point about pay is an important one. That's why we have, of course, introduced not one, but two pay uplifts in my time uh, as health secretary. Uh, and what we'll also do is, of course, make sure that we get rid of that inconsistency uh, across the country, that postcode lottery that I think you rightly uh, has made reference to previously about terms and conditions across the country with the introduction of the National Care Service, and I look forward to Labour's support in that endeavour. Supplementary, uh, Willie Rennie. I, I don't think the Minister really understands the depth of the problem in social care. I have got reports of people stuck in hospital endlessly because there is no care home packages. I have got missed visits because there is no care, home, care at home staff. And also people not getting the end of life care that they are desperately needing. They are dying before they get that care. Why has the Minister allowed this to get so bad? Cabinet Secretary. I, mean, I understand why Willie Rennie, of course, rightly asked the question. I, I find the question uh, that he asked in an extraordinarily patronising manner because there is not a single person in this front bench, myself included, that does not understand uh, the depths. And he does not know, of course, any of our personal circumstances, but many of us 
uh, of course, also uh, are dealing with these issues uh, very personally uh, as well. So I, I, don't, uh, I don't want him to think that there is no urgency from the government. That is why we have recruited into social care. That is why we continue to speak with, meet with, offer support to health and social care partnerships up and down the country. And that is why, of course, we are bringing forward the national care service so we can have that consistency of standard and, in fact, accountability to ministers but that doesn't exist in the same uh, way uh, currently under the, in, under the structures. I know his party opposed that, but I would be keen, even though they oppose that, to have a discussion with Willie Rennie about the importance of the National Care Service. But he should be left in no doubt about the seriousness of this issue and how seriously we take it. That's why we'll continue to invest in social care. Uh, and, of course, if he wants to have a, a, a detailed discussion about that, uh, my door is open to him. And supplementary, Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The cost of living crisis, including the increasing cost of fuel, uh, will be worrying our vital health and social care staff. And I was recently contacted by a constituent highlighting the impact this could have on NHS community nurses and district nurses. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if there are any plans to increase business mileage payments for NHS employees to ensure they reflect the rising cost of fuel? Secretary. All I can say at this stage is that is something that is under uh, consideration. It was an issue that was raised by the RCN uh, today, this morning, from a very powerful contribution uh, from the hospital at home team at NHS uh, Lothian. So it's an issue that's under uh, consideration. Question number two, Liam MacArthur. Thank you to ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting the provision of community first responders in island communities. Cabinet Secretary. Community first responders, they are dedicated and valuable assets to the island communities they serve. And let me thank them for all that they have done throughout the pandemic, but even pre-pandemic uh, as well. They are highly valued by both the Scottish Ambulance Service and indeed by this government. The Scottish Ambulance Service is primarily responsible for supporting the provision of uh, community first responders. The Scottish Government also provides funding to support the Brit British Association for Immediate Care Scotland that provides high quality pre-hospital emergency care training to health professionals in Scotland. This training is for rural clinicians such as GPs and ANPs, advanced uh, nurse practitioners, in order to support first responders in providing care to patients until the emergency services arrive. Lee MacArthur. Uh, can I thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary and agree with his comments in relation to the vital role community responders play, certainly in Orkney, and I pay tribute to the work they do in keeping uh, their communities safe. But at present, though, some responders are considering leaving the service, whether frustrated at inconsistencies in the way responders on different islands are treated or concerned at unsustainable burdens being placed upon them. This could obviously have serious consequences for the island communities concerned. So will the Cabinet Secretary ensure that NHS Orkney and Scottish Ambulance Service are supported, including financially, to develop models that work in an island context and provide greater consistency of support for community responders? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I think, again, this is an exceptionally important issue that has been raised by, by Liam MacArthur. I am aware that there are different local arrangements uh, across the islands, which mean that some responders are paid on-call sessions and for call-outs by Scottish Ambulance Service, while others operate on an entirely voluntary basis. I understand uh, as well that the member has had discussions with the Scottish Ambulance Service on this issue, uh, I think just earlier this week, uh, and, and, and the Scottish Ambulance Service has assured me that they are committed to working with NHS Orkney and the local community to find, to find a suitable resolution around this issue, and I have asked to be kept updated uh, on the progress of that. A supplementary, uh, Sanjish Gohani. Could we unmute Dr. Gohani? Hello? We need to unmute. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. thank you. Please proceed. Thank you. Suffering an out of hospital heart attack has a very bad survival rate, but using a defibrillator can save lives. And I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary joins me in wanting to have defibrillators across our communities. Would the Cabinet Secretary be able to make money available for amateur sports clubs across the country to have defibrillators installed? And would he make funds also available to roll out the registration of the current defibrillators on the circuit programme by the British Heart Foundation? Cabinet Secretary. I, I, know, I know Dr Kohani has a real interest in, in sport. I think uh, he perhaps uh, is, is, is a doctor for uh, a football club. Uh, certainly, I know he was in a past life. Uh, so I know this is an, this is an issue that is uh, close to his heart. Um, and, and absolutely, I will look at uh, what more funding and what more support we can provide uh, in this respect. Question number three, Graeme Simpson. 
to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce neurodevelopmental neuro assessment waiting times in Lanarkshire. Minister Kevin Stewart. President officer, the Scottish Government is committed to implementing the National Neurodevelopmental Specification Principles and Standards of Care for Children and Young People, published in September of 2021, which specifies service standards that all children's services should follow to ensure access to support is effective and consistent across Scotland. The Scottish Government has also commissioned directors of eHealth working with others, including Public Health Scotland, to work to improve digital infrastructure applications and data to report on all standards within the national neurodevelopmental specification. In addition to these actions and to support this work, £3.06 million has been allocated to NHS boards in 2021-22 to build professional capacity within boards to support children and young people with neurodevelopmental support needs. Graham Simpson. I thank the Minister for that answer. Ahead of receiving a neurodevelopment assessment, it is common for children under five to be vetted by a community paediatrician. Um, I have got a constituent who has been told by NHS Lanarkshire that her son will have to wait 21 months to see a paediatrician. That does not include the delays on the NDS waiting list, which is currently two to three years. So, Can the Minister say what progress the Scottish Government is making on its target referenced by the Minister set last September, that children and young people should receive their assessments within four weeks of identification of need, and can he just confirm um, what specific funding has been allocated for catch-up uh, in relation to the assessments? Minister. Um, thank you, President Officer. It is very difficult for me to comment on an individual case. Uh, but if Mr Simpson uh, gets in touch with me, we will have a look at all of that. I know that this will be a worrying time for uh, that family involved, uh, and uh, we will see what we can do if Mr Simpson uh, gets in touch. Uh, in general, uh, can I say, President Officer, that we are closely monitoring NHS boards with significant performance challenges, including NHS Lanarkshire, uh, and supporting the continuous development of their detailed local improvement plans. Um, the creation of these plans is further supported with direct enhanced support from subject matter experts and the sharing of best practice. And NHS Lanarkshire has appointed two waiting list coordinators who are taking forward a validation ex exercise for CAMS and neurodevelopmental neuro work, which should be completed by the end of March. I will also ask them to look at the specifics uh, of the situation that Mr Simpson has described. The supplementary, Colette Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the work being done to tackle waiting times. Can the Minister confirm whether the Scottish Government is working with stakeholders such as the NHS, local authorities and the third sector to maximise the support available to people waiting on a formal diagnosis who still require some work and some sort of input and how we can improve this to ensure individuals get the support they need. Minister. Um, thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Yes is a brief answer. Through our Children and Young People's Mental Health and Wellbeing Joint Delivery Board, uh, we continue to work with colleagues across the NHS, local authorities and those within the third sector to improve support for children and uh, young people. Uh, in particular, we have recently provided additional funding to five local authority areas to take forward tests of change on the implementation of the neurodevelopment uh, service specification. Thank you. Uh, question number four, Claire Baker. I hope there's no technical problem. There seems to be a technical problem. Okay, question number four, Claire Baker. Thank you, President Officer. There was an issue with the Consul. Um, to ask the Scottish Government how it is targeting investment to improve services for people with problem alcohol use. Minister Marie Todd. We announced £100 million of additional investment to increase the availability of residential rehabilitation, which will benefit people with alcohol use disorders. 
We are exploring the evidence around managed alcohol programmes for people who experience homelessness by contributing to the running and evaluation of the Simon Community Scotland pilot in Glasgow. And last year, we launched our framework towards a whole family approach. This sets out the principles of how we will improve holistic support for families affected by drugs and alcohol and using family inclusive practice. Claire Baker. Um, thank you. As the Minister will know, the number of people who died directly because of alcohol use in 2020 increased by 17% to 1,190. While I appreciate the long-awaited alcohol treatment guidance is the responsibility of the UK Government, when it is introduced in Scotland, will the Scottish Government commit to introducing standards similar to the MAT standards that have been introduced for problematic drug use, which would look to provide a framework for people with problem alcohol use to ensure they get the support they desperately need? Minister. Absolutely. We have been working with the UK Government and the other devolved administrations on reviewing and updating clinical guidelines for alcohol treatment. And the guidance will look to introduce new approaches to treatment and will apply to a broad range of settings, including primary care and hospital and justice set settings. And this will support the development of a clear consensus on good practice and help services to implement interventions for alcohol use disorders that are recommended by the National Institute for Health and Care e Excellence. Successful implementation of the guidelines for alcohol treatment in Scotland will set a platform for our work around introducing standards and targets. Let me assure the member as well that the Scottish Government are working hard to understand the commonality between the medication-assisted treatments for drug treatment that can be applied to alcohol treatment. Officials from both alcohol and drug policy are working closely together to explore the opportunities for alcohol treatment, ensuring that we are learning from the experience of embedding drug MAT standards. And supplementary, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. We know the benefits of keeping families together during treatment, not only aiding a person's recovery, but also reducing harms on their children. Can the Minister expand on the work of the Aber Lauer project and how this will support improved outcomes for women and children? Minister. So the member is absolutely correct. A key recommendation set out by both the Drugs Test um, De Death Task Force and the Residential Rehabilitation Development Working Group was to improve residential services for both women and children. Um, it, with regard to drugs-related deaths, there has been a disproportionate increase in, amongst women, and the need to act on these recommendations has never been greater. It was announced on the 23rd of March that funding will be given to Aberlour Children Charity to establish two new recovery units specifically aimed at helping women and their children through treatment. And that project will provide Scotland's first dedicated mother and child residential care units and will allow women to receive recovery report, re support whilst living with their children. These new units will provide eight new residential rehabilitation placements for women in Scotland. The houses will be designed to enable children of women with problem substance use to stay with their mothers during their recovery. And the service will integrate addiction services with mental health and homelessness services, as well as taking a person-centred approach to recovery. The project has the support of the Promise Scotland, which aims to give families the support they need to stay together and it will help to ensure that many women can access residential treatment without fear of their children being removed from their care. Uh, question number six has been withdrawn. Question number seven, Stephen Kerr. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what assurances it can provide regarding the support that is given to people who attend a and &E between the hours of 5.30pm and 9am with suicidal intentions. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Everyone in need of emergency mental health care must receive that support quickly and wherever possible close to home. NHS 24's Mental Health Hub provides 24-7 support for anyone seeking mental health support, and health boards have made considerable progress in improving care for those seeking out of our support through a rollout of mental health assessment services. Where there is a real threat to life, people can be directed to and receive prompt care in A&E departments. Each health board has arrangements in place to ensure patients presenting at A&E in mental health crisis are properly assessed and cared for at any time of the day. In practice, this involves specialist mental health clinical staff working alongside A&E teams to ensure people who have suicidal intentions are assessed and that tailored care plans are put in place. Those care plans may include accessing support from crisis support organisations or local mental health services or, where necessary, admission to hospital. 
The Distress Brief Intervention Programme provides personalised, compassionate support to people who present to frontline services, including A&E departments in emotional distress, but who do not need emergency clinical services. DBI is available nationally via NHS 24 and provides practical support to help people understand and manage their distress. Stephen Kerr. There are between 15 and 20 people in the Falkirk area who repeatedly present to A&E accompanied by police officers due to suicide attempts. The police pass them into the care of the NHS and then too often the NHS discharge them at times when support services are closed, sometimes even in the middle of the night. So will the Minister or perhaps even the Cabinet Secretary agree to meet with me and con concern constituents to discuss these matters further in detail with a view to perhaps stopping A&E discharging vulnerable people at times when they can't access the support that they need. Minister. Um, President Officer, uh, we know uh, that some people experiencing mental ill health and distress uh, present in A&E and a minority of people do so repeatedly um, as Mr Kerr has described. Uh, and through the redesign of urgent care programme, the government is working with partners to ensure that people do not have to attend A&E uh, to receive the care that they need. However, when they do, improvements to our, our urgent care response will ensure appointments can be scheduled so that clinicians are ready to receive them, providing care quickly and reducing waiting times for patients. I am very keen to get the redesign of urgent care programme absolutely right, uh, and I am happy uh, to meet with Mr Kerr. And I can squeeze in question number eight, if I could please have succinct questions and answers. Question number eight, Stephanie Callaghan. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether the number of people in hospital with COVID-19 recently reaching the highest level since the pandemic began has impacted on its modelling and risk assessment regarding the ending of free testing for the general population from 30th of April. Cabinet Secretary. Although case, quick case rates are uh, currently high in Scotland, we now recognise we are in a different phase of the pandemic. The testing will still be required for other purposes that will play an ongoing role in supporting patient treatment and care, protecting those at the highest risk, uh, in, in highest risk settings, and it will be a key part of surveillance. Our modelling is continually updated based on a range of data, including hospital occupancy and infection levels. Stephanie Callaghan. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I am um, also interested in any comments the Cabinet Secretary may have in response to third sector organisations and professional bodies who have recently raised further concerns for those they represent who are either in the high risk health group or working environment um, and the impact of the anti-symptomatic testing will have on their health and wellbeing, as well as their confidence and ability to carry out their professional duties. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, and, and obviously we've set out in our transition plan our details, uh, our, our, our continued testing uh, for those in, in high-risk uh, settings. What I would say uh, to uh, Stephanie Callaghan is that I met with a group of uh, carers uh, this morning who were speaking on their behalf and on behalf of those that they care for. And there is still, I recognise, some anxiety for those who were on the high risk list, uh, highest risk list. And, and that is currently being reviewed by clinicians, as indicated by the CMO in his latest uh, letter to that group. But, of course, uh, the review is anticipated to conclude shortly. Uh, and I'll make sure that Stephanie Callaghan is kept uh, updated. Thank you. And we will now move on to the next uh, portfolio of questions. I will allow a short pause to enable front bench teams to move seat if they wish. Thank you. Okay, uh, so the next portfolio is social justice, housing and local government. If a member wishes to request a supplementary question, they should press the request to speak button or indicate so in the chat function by entering the letter R. 
During the relevant question, I call question number one, Willie Rennie. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the reported ongoing shortage of social housing since 2007. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. Uh, well, I'm very proud of our record of delivering over 108,000 affordable homes since 2007, with more than 75,000 of these for social rent. And we are committed to delivering 110,000 affordable homes by 2032, of which at least 70% will be available for social rent and 10% will be in our remote, rural and island communities. To support that aim, our total planned investment of £3.6 billion in this Parliament means we can continue the important work started in 2007 of ensuring that everyone in Scotland has a warm, safe and affordable place to live. Willie Rennie. But the trouble is SNP housing ministers have been saying exactly the same thing for the last 15 years. But in Fife, there are 16,000 people on the Fife Housing Register waiting list. The Minister wrote to me recently claiming that under the Affordable Housing Supply Programme, there were 370 new houses built in Fife last year. But at the current rate of progress, it will take another 43 and a half years to clear the waiting list. So shouldn't the housing strategy be changed from housing 2040 to housing 2065? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so SNP housing ministers have been delivering affordable homes, 108,000 since 2007 and another 110,000 by uh, 2032. In Fife, um, let me tell Willie Rennie this, since 2007 a total of 6,011 affordable homes have been delivered in the Fife council area, 4,485 of which were homes uh, for social rent. Investment in Fife will be at a record level in this parliamentary period at £179.3 million. And this will deliver a range of housing and a mix of affordable uh, tenures. Investment in this year alone of £40.2 million will mean an estimated 40, 400 sorry, affordable homes will start on site and a further 370 homes are expected to be completed, the vast majority of which will be for social rent. So we will continue to get on with delivering affordable homes. And Willie Rennie comes here and says, you know, uh, do we, we need a housing strategy with a longer time frame. How about Willie Rennie, for once, comes to this chamber with some positive suggestions and proposals? Because we are delivering affordable housing in Scotland at a level well exceeding anywhere else on these islands, and that is something that I'm proud of. Uh, and supplementary, Mercedes Vialba. Thank you. As well as the ongoing shortage of social housing, there's a lack of democracy over rent increases in the social rented sector. Most social landlords conduct limited consultation of tenants, presenting them with no choice other than to accept a rent increase. The Tenants' Union, Living Rent, are calling for statutory and binding rent consultations which present a real choice to tenants, empowering them to reject rent increases if they wish to do so. Will the Scottish Government stand up for tenants by making this change? Cabinet Secretary. Well, first of all, let me uh, say to the member that the affordability of rents um, is a, a huge priority for this government, and that's why my colleague uh, Patrick Harvey is taking forward uh, the, the rental uh, housing strategy uh, out for consultation. And, of course, the affordability of rents and uh, rent controls is an important part of that. In terms of the social rented sector, uh, the member should be aware that, of course, the regulator has a role here, uh, the housing regulator, in terms of making sure that rent levels are uh, not increasing at a scale that is uh, unacceptable. Of course, we want to keep rent levels uh, at a, an affordable level for tenants. Uh, and importantly, the member should recognise that the rent, rental income from a, a social housing for councils and uh, housing associations, of course, is reinvested in further affordable housing stock. And hopefully that's something that she would welcome. And supplementary, Stephanie Callaghan. Thank you. Can the Cabinet Secretary comment on how the measured lifting of COVID restrictions will support the construction sector to get back to a normal level of delivery and, by extension, support the delivery of affordable housing plans? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I am sure the member is aware, as others will be, that delivery continues to be challenging due to the ongoing impact of the current 
tender in climate, which is being affected by global issues around materials and skilled labour supply, shortages and associated rise in costs, as well as the impact of the pandemic still having an effect. So we are working closely with our social and affordable housing delivery partners to ensure the delivery of uh, warm, affordable homes. Uh, recent completion figures show positive progress with a welcome 35 per cent increase in completed homes when compared to the previous year. But it is a concern and we are working with local partners to try and make sure that that uh, affordable housing supply uh, uh, programme uh, keeps the momentum that it needs to keep. Question number two, Paul O'Kane. To ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to support local authorities in providing adapted housing. Cabinet Secretary. Um, so, uh, local authorities are uh, responsible for determining local housing needs and priorities, including for people who need uh, adapted housing. However, we know there are issues with how adaptations are accessed and delivered locally, and we are taking forward a programme of work to streamline and make the process easier for people. We are working to increase the supply of accessible and adapted homes. Wherever possible, all new affordable homes are designed to be flexible to meet people's needs as they change over time. We are also delivering a programme to retrofit homes in the social rented sector to make them more accessible. Paul okay. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response? And I know what she says in terms of aids and adaptations. And indeed, in a previous answer from Kevin Stewart, I note the commitment of £20 million in extra funding for housing related to uh, bringing people home and, and out of uh, long-stay hospitals. Uh, although funding has been committed, it does seem that there is no real targets attached to a lot of that money. And given that organisations such as Enable Scotland, the MS Society and MND Scotland have highlighted and campaigned on the need for speed and adapted housing, will the Cabinet Secretary commit to at least a 10 per cent target for new social housing with properties which are fully accessible both internally and externally? Cabinet Secretary. Um, so I am certainly uh, wanting to um, look at how we can make uh, the improvements in delivering more accessible homes. Of course, the member will be aware of the housing for uh, varying uh, needs. Um, and although it is a, a good standard, uh, we are commencing work on a review of the Housing for Various Varying Needs Design Guide. In terms of targets, I mean, we would expect local partners to be mapping out what the needs in those areas are, and rather than necessarily setting a national uh, arbitrary uh, target, I think it's, it's more important that local authorities identify what the needs are in their areas. And of course, there are uh, requirements now for uh, local authorities to report back in terms of the number of uh, wheelchair accessible housing. But if there's more we can do, I'm happy to continue to talk to the member about that. Question number three, Megan Gallagher. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will introduce the same proposals as the UK Government that will remove unsafe cladding from all medium or high-rise buildings. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, by adopting a critical new British Standards Institute guidance called the PASS 9980, the UK Government has adopted the Scottish Government's approach, which combines building integrity and fire safety. And of course, this move is welcomed. Our single building assessment is the right solution for Scotland's unique tenure system and the need for a bespoke solution. And we await news, of course, of the UK Government's proposed uh, developer fund and how this will support the devolved administrations. I will update members in due course on our further plans to help more homeowners with assessment and to mitigate and remediate their, pri their properties against unsafe cladding. Megan Gallagher. The Building Standards Fire Safety Review Panel meeting in January published this week revealed the panel recommended that the BS 8414 test should be retained. This recommendation contrasts with England and Wales, which have had a regulatory ban on the use of this test for high-rise domestic and institutional buildings for several years now. Support for a regulatory ban on BS 8414 was the most popular choice in the Scottish Government's recent consultation, with the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, Scottish Tenants Organisation and many local councils amongst those in favour. So I would like to ask the Cabinet Secretary, will Scotland join England and Wales in properly ban combustible cladding and insulation from high-rise buildings or not? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we are taking forward the, the requirements and, of course, we um, had a different set of building standards already in place. But we are taking forward 
uh, the necessary changes that will ensure that we deal with um, the, the, um, the, the building standards that are required, uh, taking those forward. And uh, I'm happy to write to the member with the detail of that. But that is just one element of addressing uh, the issue. Um, building standards are critical, and Scotland, as I said earlier, has some of the, the, the most rigorous building standards in the UK. Uh, and I hope the member will appreciate that. But going forward, we need to make sure that the issues that are being addressed are not just about building standards, but are addressing issues around insurance, uh, around uh, mortgage availability, many, all of which, of course, are reserved matters sitting with the UK government. What I would like to see is more of a partnership working around all of these issues, but it's incredibly difficult when the UK government seems to fail to understand the issues of property law and property rights here in Scotland, and that is getting in the way not just of resolution here in Scotland, but in Wales as well. And getting uh, the UK government to listen to that is very, very difficult. But if the members can assist with that, that would be very welcome. And supplementary Willie Coffey, who is joining us remotely. Thank you. Could the Cabinet Secretary detail what fire safety actions the Scottish Government has taken to enhance the safety of buildings based on the work of the Ministerial Working Group on Building Fire Safety? Cabinet Secretary. Yep. Well, as I said in my, my previous answer, um, uh, so in October 2019, we took strong steps to ensure that building safety uh, by strengthening guidance relating to the use of combustible cladding, means of escape and measures to assist the, the, the fire service. So we took those strong steps back then. Uh, from February, all homeowners and, uh, and social uh, housing uh, tenants have been required to have interlinked alarms under legislation brought forward after the Grenfell Tower tragedy in 2017. And of course, private rented and new built homes must already meet those standards. But from February, they have applied to every home in Scotland, regardless of age or tenure. And we will continue our work focusing on building safety by bringing forward further legislation and updated guidance related to cladding shortly. And in the same way that I offered to write to Megan Gallagher with some further details of that, uh, I'm happy to write to uh, Willie Coffey with the same. A supplementary, Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. Would the Government take this opportunity following news this week of allegations of lobbying towards the Scottish Government to confirm that they will not be swayed by vested interests and will indeed follow the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and ban combustible cladding on high-rise buildings? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I've just said, we are going to continue our work focusing on building safety by bringing forward further legislation and updated guidance relating to cladding shortly. Uh, happy to also include uh, Martin Whit Whitfield uh, in th uh, that correspondence to uh, provide more detail on that. It, you know, at the end of the day, what's important in terms of the, the action that this government takes is, is based on the expert advice that we receive. Um, and that is important, and not least when you're dealing with quite technical issues like building standards. So that is the, the, the process that I will continue to follow. But as I say, I'm happy to write to the three members who have asked during this session around that further legislation and updated dated guidance, if that would be helpful. Question number four, Alex Go Hamilton. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Do you ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what plans it has to tackle homelessness? Cabinet Secretary. So we are working uh, tirelessly with our local government and third sector partners to end homelessness and rough sleeping and ensure everyone has a safe, warm, affordable place to call home. Our Ending Homelessness Together Action Plan, backed by funding of £100 million between 2018 and 2026, outlines our objectives and we publish an annual report to show the progress made. Uh, to end homelessness, of course, we must prevent it from happening in the first place, which is why we are currently consulting on plans for new legal duties on public bodies and landlords to prevent homelessness and to ask and act about somebody's housing situation. Uh, Alex Go Hamilton. I am very grateful for that reply. Uh, presiding officer, homelessness in Scotland has long been a national scandal, but shamefully, 245 veterans were sleeping rough or in temporary accommodation last year alone. Many suffer from PTSD as a result of their experiences whilst in the line of duty, which makes adjusting back to civilian life all the more challenging. 
These are people who have risked their lives in the service of this country. And now, when they are in need of our support, they are quite literally being left out in the cold. When the government released its Ending Homelessness Annual Report last year, it made no mention of homeless veterans at all. So can I ask the First Minister, what is being done to offer mental health, housing and employment support to our veterans so that this terrible pattern is ended once and for all? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, can I say, first of all, to Alec, Cole Hamilton, I absolutely recognise the particular needs that veterans uh, may have. Um, obviously, the government for some time has had a, a strategy and plan for veterans that looks at all of the particular needs uh, that veterans may have, housing being one. Um, the fact that we have recognised through our Housing First model that people will have uh, specific needs and multiple and complex needs and that housing first recognises that, that it's not just about giving someone a front door key, it's about the wraparound services that they require. Uh, so housing first can be a good solution for veterans in many cases and the rapid rehousing uh, plans that local authorities have been developing very much recognises the needs of those with complex needs, including veterans. Uh, but that's something I am happy to specifically uh, speak to um, the, my officials about in just terms of making sure that we're doing everything we can in terms of making sure that Housing First um, can uh, accommodate the needs of veterans in the fullest sense. Supplementary, Miles Briggs. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary says that she's working tirelessly um, yet the number of people in, who are homeless in the capital is increasing and Scottish ministers are holding back £9.3 million of emergency homeless support because of a bureaucratic anomaly. Now, how does the Cabinet Secretary expect Edinburgh City Council to end homelessness by the end of this Parliament um, when they are being chronically underfunded by the Scottish Government? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the technicality that Miles Briggs has raised in this chamber before is that Edinburgh Council has not chosen to delegate its homelessness services to Edinburgh City Integration Authority. And so any funding uh, provided to the Integration Authority cannot be used to tackle homelessness. Now, Miles Briggs and other colleagues will come to this chamber and complain about us interfering in local matters when it suits and then tell us that we have to intervene. This is a matter for Edinburgh Council to decide how it organises its homelessness services. Now, let me say what... Um, Cabinet what... Secretary, please resume your seat. Far too much sedentary cat calling. Cabinet Secretary, please resume. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Tackling homelessness in the City of Edinburgh is a priority and that is why of course we are funding uh, Edinburgh City Council along with other local authorities to make sure that we take forward uh, the, the work to address and reduce the use of temporary accommodation and also through the affordable housing programme uh, to build new homes and acquire uh, new homes and that is the work that we will continue uh, to do. Um, and of course, the majority of funding local authorities receive for tackling homelessness is provided through the annual local government finance settlement. But there needs to be a bit of consistency here from Miles Briggs, because one of the issues that Edinburgh is taking forward, of course, is their plan to tackle, uh, to tackle um, uh, short-term lets and holiday lets through the... Well, no, it is relevant, uh, Miles Briggs. Because it is relevant because Edinburgh Excuse City Council... Excuse me, Cabinet Secretary, please resume. Uh, again, this is a conversation uh, that is not through the chair. We're in a parliament. Please act through the chair. Please resume, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. Edinburgh City Council has been consulting on making the whole of Edinburgh a short-term let control area and to restrict the use of uh, losing properties to the, the short-term let market. Well, what did the Tories do and what did Miles Briggs do? They voted against it. They voted against these measures. So when this government brings forward measures to address some of the homelessness issues within the city of Edinburgh, Miles Briggs votes against them. So you can't come here complaining about something when you vote against actions that will actually help to address the situation. That's hypocrisy. Supplementary, Eleanor Whitton. As a former frontline homelessness worker, it is welcome to hear the Cabinet Secretary outline the Scottish Government, um, how the Scottish Government is working to tackle homelessness. But does she share my frustration that actions taken by the UK Government, in particular the deeply damaging £20 per week cut to universal credit, risks undermining our efforts? Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, well, ye yes, I do. And I think it's another example of uh, the Tories doing something on the one hand that actually undermines uh, those who are on the lowest incomes. And the removal of the £20 universal credit uplift has had a number of impacts uh, and I absolutely directly related to homelessness and making the lives of those who are struggling uh, even more difficult. Um, but again, you know, we have the Tory MSPs coming here complaining about something that their own government is, on the other hand, making ten times worse. And perhaps they should have a word with their Tory colleagues down south. Question number five, Michael Mara. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to improve audit procedures for local authorities. Uh, Minister Ben McPherson. The audit of local authorities is delivered by Audit Scotland on behalf of the Accounts Commission operating independently of the Scottish Government. Uh, improvements to audit procedures for local authorities would be a matter for Audit Scotland and the Accounts Commission to consider. Michael Mara. For that response. The Minister may be aware of not one, not two, but three major building and maintenance failures at Dundee City Council, which have resulted in local taxpayers footing a minimum bill of £11 million and rising. The SNP administration ignored repeated warnings that the Olympia Leisure Centre required urgent maintenance over a period of years. That eight year old building now looks set to be closed for over 18 months. Audit procedures have clearly failed. Will the Minister back an urgent public inquiry into how the people of Dundee have been so badly failed by the SNP Council administration? Minister. As uh, the Member will be aware, uh, councils are independent corporate bodies, separate from the Scottish Government, and councils conduct uh, internal scrutiny of their own activities through an audit or, or scrutiny committee, uh, which examines the, the performance um, and management of risk within, within the Council. This is therefore uh, the, the matters, uh, Mr. Mararizzi, are therefore a, a matter for, for Dundee City Council to, to review and address. Uh, it is my understanding um, that uh, the, the uh, scrutiny committee, uh, who has been looking at the, the matters raised, um, have, have met in recent weeks. Um, that the, the, the committee are, are chaired and co-chaired uh, by uh, a number of councillors, as you would expect, uh, including opposition parties and that uh, the, the uh, Olympic building that, that Mr Mara referenced is, is operated by an ALIO which um, has councillors on the board um, giving oversight from, from a cross-section uh, cross of, of political parties, as you expect. Um, it is my understanding that the Scrutiny Board uh, has uh, the ability to interrogate and investigate uh, in, a, in, in a broad manner with, with broad power. Um, so, as I said, is the, the matters raised are, are for Dundee City Council to, to review and address how However, um, if, if Mr Mara wants to, to engage in written correspondence, I would, of course, um, be happy to receive that um, and uh, consider um, whether uh, this, the, the Council, uh, and particularly if the Council wanted to get in touch with the Scottish Government uh, to seek support or assistance from the Scottish Government, we could, of course, consider that. Supplementary, Dr Lumsden. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Recently, a Chief Education Officer in Aberdeenshire Council broke freedom of information and data protection laws by sending a threatening email to someone who was asking FOI questions about education. It appears that the officer has also broken the Council's statutory responsibility as a Chief Education Officer. Should breaches of this nature be investigated by Audit Scotland? And if not, who should investigate local authorities when these rules are broken? And is the government aware of the questions that led to this serious breach? Minister. I don't think it would be appropriate for me to comment on the individual case raised by the member in, in this forum. Um, however, I'm sure he will be aware of the, the relevant bodies to take the, the matter up with. Question number six, Julie Mackay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its discussions with the UK Government to ensure that refugees arriving in Scotland from Ukraine have access to the resources that they need. Minister Neil Gray. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. We have been working closely with the UK Government on the operation of their Homes for Ukraine scheme and Scotland's super sponsor offer to provide a safe uh, place of refuge and sanctuary to displaced Ukrainians as part of this uh, scheme, and it is now open. The people uh, who come here from Ukraine have a right to work, access to social security and public funds, so we will be ensuring people are aware of and get access to the wide range of services and support they need. The complex needs and human rights of those fleeing the atrocities in Ukraine are our number one priority. Welcome packs in Ukrainian will provide information on accessing a range of support, and translators will be on hand to help, and trauma experts on call. Julie Mackay. 
This morning at the Leveling Up Housing and Communities Committee in the House of Commons, Lord Harrington, the Minister for Refugees, said he had previously inadvertently given the wrong information on the £10,500 per person tariff that local authorities would receive to support refugees from Ukraine settling in our communities. He clarified that this funding would now only be available based on numbers of people coming through the Homes for Ukraine scheme and not anyone settling through the Family scheme. Does the Minister agree with me that this lack of parity for people fleeing the same war is just unacceptable? Minister. Yes, I do. and I uh, thank Gillian Mackay for raising this very important and concerning development. I said before in my previous answer that uh, we have been working closely and working well at both an official and ministerial level. It is therefore all the more uh, disappointing uh, that the first we heard of this development was when Lord Harrington articulated it to the Commons Committee uh, this morning. That is clearly unacceptable in itself. Uh, this £10,500 per person tariff is for local authorities, and I quote, to provide support to families uh, to uh, rebuild their lives and fully integrate into communities. It is, therefore, it is there to meet costs incurred by councils that will be there regardless of how they arrive. And the Scottish Government is, of course, providing local authorities with funding over and above uh, the UK Government tariff of £13 million. But the UK Government decision will clearly leave some local authorities disadvantaged um, because uh, displaced people have arrived via the family route rather than uh, the Homes for Ukrainian or Super Sponsor route. So any areas currently where there are significant uh, Ukrainian uh, populations settled here will obviously have more people arriving via the family route and therefore uh, will be disadvantaged. So I totally agree that this potential lack of parity is unacceptable, and I can assure Gillian Mackay that we will be pursuing this vigorously with the uh, UK Government, as I expect other areas across the UK uh, to do likewise. They must reconsider. And brief supplementary, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Minister, the uh, welcome hubs for Ukrainian refugees will be vital in getting the right information to, to people arriving in Scotland. But what can wider Civic Scotland and the media do to ensure the dignity, respect and the privacy is given to Ukrainian refugees to allow them the time to settle in Scotland. Uh, Minister. Thank you, President Officer. And I thank Claire Aronson for, for raising this really important issue. And I think it should go without saying that people arriving here who are escaping the trauma of war should be afforded the dignity and the privacy to be able to rebuild their lives here in Scotland. And I hope that that can be respected uh, by everyone um, across Scotland, the media uh, and uh, others included. Uh, and we will absolutely do be doing all we can with our local authority and third sector partners to ensure uh, that we are giving the safeguarding, the protection uh, that people arriving here from uh, Ukraine need. I think there is a genuine goodwill uh, towards people arriving here from the people of Scotland, which has been heartening. Uh, but I think, it, uh, I think Claire Amson is right to make sure that we continue to reflect to ensure that they are given a warm Scotch welcome when they arrive. And I can squeeze in questions seven and eight if I do have succinct questions and answers. Questions seven, Craig Hoy. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to engage local authorities in programmes to tackle the gap between Scotland's most affluent and most deprived communities. Cabinet Secretary. The Tackling Child Poverty Delivery Plan published last week sets out a range of bold and ambitious actions, many of which will be taken forward with our partners in local government. This includes taking immediate steps to mitigate the UK Government benefit cap, which is a harmful policy that disproportionately impacts on our poorest. Uh, and we will also work with councils to deliver a new employment uh, support offer for parents backed by an initial investment of up to £81 million in the next financial year and a transition fund to support parents into employment. Local government is a key partner and will continue to engage with them as part of our national mission to tackle child poverty. Craig Hoy. I thank the Minister for that answer and I draw uh, colleagues' attention to my register of interests as an East Lothian councillor. As we seek to close the gap between Scotland's richest and poorest communities following 15 years of SNP in action, Will the Minister now welcome the next wave of levelling up funding, which will deliver millions of pounds to local authorities and communities across Scotland? And does she agree that this will create new jobs, boost training, grow productivity and deliver tremendous economic benefit to Scotland's local authorities? And following the announcement that eight projects in Scotland have already received a share uh, of more than £170 Mr. million, pounds, Thank you. will she set aside uh, her uh, petty constitutional Cabinet Secretary. and support this Cabinet. Uh, second Thank wave? Thank you, Mr Hoy. Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I say to Mr Hoy, uh, we welcome any money, if it's actual real new money, uh, wherever it comes from. Uh, but can I say uh, to, to Craig Hoy, it wouldn't have been better if his Chancellor had perhaps 
um, when he, he stood up to announce uh, in the spring statement, had actually given some real support to some of our deprived communities by supporting people on benefits and those in low-income households. What a contrast between what he announced and what we were able to announce last week in the Child Poverty Delivery Plan. There couldn't be a greater uh, contrast, presiding officer. Question number eight, Brian Hoyter. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure that building standards on construction of new housing developments maximise energy efficiency and opportunities for renewable energy generation. Minister Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Our most re recent review of the building regs concludes next month, with regulations being implemented this October. It will include a significant uplift in fabric standards, reducing heating demand, supporting the effective use of renewable technologies, uh, and they will also future-proof heating in new homes against the proposed 2024 new build heat standard. And we will work with industry. We are already working with industry, both to support delivery of these changes and investigate uh, further improvement. Frank Wisdom. I yeah, thank the Minister for that answer, but the Minister will be aware that there is a cost implication, a significant cost implication to constructing energy efficiency as well as energy generating homes. And as I heard the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee yesterday, there is already a shortage of tradesmen and women to deal with the current demand in housing. So I can ask the Minister how the Government proposes that the new energy generating and efficient housing will be funded and where the funding for training and upskilling of the construction force, workforce that is required will come from. Minister. Uh, well, as part of uh, the answer is the, the public investment of at least £1.8 billion during the course of this Parliament uh, to support accelerated deployment of heat and energy efficiency measures, uh, a, as well as support to the uh, uh, Scottish Government's affordable housing supply programme, uh, working uh, with the, the social housing sector. But we also recognise that this challenge will go beyond what the public sector can meet. So we have the, the Green Heat Finance Task Force already meeting to explore the widest possible range uh, of solutions to meet the considerable investment that we need over the coming decades to achieve this urgent and necessary challenge. Thank you, Minister. That concludes portfolio questions. And there will be a short pause before we move on to the next item of business. Thank you.